Good afternoon and welcome. I want to give everybody a warm welcome to this inauguration of Martijn de Waal as Professor of Civic Interaction Design. Yes, it's a special day. It's a celebration where knowledge meets design, meets society and makes an impact. It's an honor to be your chairman of today. My name is Mauti Abunu, and I'm also a lecturer at this University of Applied Sciences. Um, we are in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, but this event will take place in English because we're still in a pandemic and it brings challenges for us coming together. But let's focus on the opportunities today. And one of the opportunities is that we are here with a wide range of people, of friends, family, colleagues, and also academic researchers. So I would like to give a special welcome to our professors who are here today. And the professors you can see um, also on screen, I think, for the people uh, who are watching now from home or from the office. Yes, there they are. Hi, everybody. Can you hear us? And can you see us clearly? Yes, <laughs> we see some waving hands. Beautiful um, that you are all here today. Also for Martijn de Waal, I think uh, this gives a yeah, special warmth and a special connection for him. So what can you expect this day? We are going to listen to the inaugural lecture of Martijn de Waal, Shaping Public Life in a Network Society. But before, we will listen to the contributions contributions of um, Dean Frank Kressin and the Rector of the University of Applied Sciences, Gelijn Meijer. In between, we will look at three short videos um, about design in society. So, Without further ado, I would like to present Frank Kressin, Dean of Faculty Digital Media and Creative Innovation. Thank you very much, uh, Mahoutin. On behalf of the Faculty of Digital Media and Creative Innovation at the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences, I'd like to welcome our virtual audience, our rector, and most notably, our valued professor of Applied Sciences, Martijn de Waal, who will deliver his inaugural lecture in just a few minutes. Martijn de Waal is leading the research group Civic Interaction Design, formerly known as Play and Civic Media, that was founded by Professor Ben Schouten in 2013. The research group is firmly embedded in the knowledge center of our faculty, that currently hosts 11 research groups and two centers of expertise. Our research aims to understand, question and design the societal impacts of digital technologies and media in order to strengthen people's ability to enact agency and take ownership in the society that they collectively spawn and mitigate our human-induced, often destructive impact, impact on our planet. Within that broad ambition, civic interaction design zooms in on the way in which the digital transition is creating new types of public spaces and new ways in which citizens and governments relate to one another. It explores the complex roles of interactive media and digital technologies in this ubiquitous development, together with companies, governments, designers, cultural institutions and, and students the research group investigates how the design of interactive experiences, digital platforms and online services can contribute to social life. The question that underpins this reads as follows. How can public values in the area of democracy, diversity and sustainability be firmly anchored in the emerging platform society? The research is strongly connected to the way in which our university is positioning itself in terms of public values, exemplified by the so-called three Ds. And this sounds better in Dutch. Duurzaamheid, um, sustainability, diversity and inclusion, and digitalization. To which it adds a fourth, democratization, that ties into and strengthens the others. Together, they form four very urgent topics that, in my humble view, merit a fundamental re-evaluation or recasting of the way in which society and also universities operate. Professor de Waal approaches his subject matter from the diverse lenses of the humanities, the social sciences and various paradigms and practices of design. He has coined this potent mix civic interaction design in line with the vibrant field of national and international scholars, activists, artists and designers. It has so far given rise to a great variety of projects, prototypes, events, tools and publications. Uh, it has done so in the past and I'm sure it will continue to do so in the future. To the benefit of students, citizens, governments, companies, non-profit organizations and education alike. 
Needless to say, I've looked tremendously forward to this day, as has Don Martijn, and now I look forward to his lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you for this strong uh, introduction. And I think uh, we all feel the importance of this day. Um, in a minute, we will listen to uh, Director of Applied Sciences, Gelijn Meijer. Gelijn created the Amsterdam Creative Industries Network, bringing academic and applied science scholars together. And he also initiated the Digital Society School, an initiative to renew education and educate digital talent. But before we're going to listen, uh, we're going to... Um, uh, take a look at our first video clip, and um, that's about Arcom and the master digital design. And it's an explored uh, design tools to raise awareness and create debate to involve citizens on their uh, future of their city. So let's have a look. Arkham is the architecture center in Amsterdam. It has been around for about 30 years. And what we do is we uh, uh, work on, exhibit on, debate on the design issues in the city. City models are a very good tool to discuss future plans or designs for the city, but they are also a bit uh, static. So there is no uh, interaction, it's not scalable, and it's not possible to use extra input inside the model. So that's why we are looking for a more interactive way of looking at city models. Something interesting we found is that these models, they're um, incredibly good at raising awareness um, and educating people, um, also fostering acceptance, um, being used as a co-creation tool, um, and also being used as a tool for testing future scenarios. It was a great opportunity um, for us to be able to work with the master digital design students. The first two groups were looking at uh, what kinds of technologies could be used using augmented reality. Um, they looked at projection mapping, they looked at object tracking. And then the third group uh, worked on a different brief, which was more related to the narrative aspects and the storytelling. The brief was how can we use data visualizations and storytelling techniques to help spark debate and dialogue within residents of the future of their city. So we decided eventually on a transmedia storytelling approach, uh, which uses a number of different components, uh, such as characters, uh, to help kind of simplify and create a human connection uh, between the data and the user. One of the key things that we wanted to do here was spark debate. Um, and that can be internally in someone's mind, it can be physically with someone that you're, that you're in the exhibition with, um, but it can also be part of a bigger conversation. For us, the 4D city making project is interesting because there is a lot going on in Amsterdam, what we call urban development. And with that, there is a lot of participation of citizens. Uh, and the participation of citizens is usually, well, you can say one dimensional. Uh, you have a room, you have people and they talk to each other and that's participation. The one thing is, uh, can we have a better discussion with this instrument? And the other thing is, can we involve other types, the non-usual suspects in the discussion with the new instrument? Yes, I think this was a beautiful first example of uh, yeah, how public life uh, in a network society works. Um, Gelijn Meijer, I want to give you the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'd like to welcome, uh, um, on behalf of the executive board of the University of Applied Science Amsterdam, all friends and relatives and interested uh, uh, participants in this uh, online session. I think it's, an, uh, it's a public event mm -hmm. to celebrate uh, the, uh, the installation of a, of a new professor. Well, in fact, Martijn is not new. He has actually been around, uh, luckily, with us for a long while. And I'm really proud that he makes this step at this point in time. He is going to be a professor in the art of practice-oriented research. And let me just sh share a few ideas on that. I think we have over the past years demonstrated as applied science universities, and the uh, University of Applied Science in Amsterdam has been uh, kind of uh, at least trying to lead that uh, in a way, to, uh, to look at research in the way that has been relatively new in the Netherlands. First of all, we always start a research from uh, a research topic, a question in society, a question which is either fundamental, like uh, what, what happens in a society due to COVID, or it can be the energy transition, of course. These are the big issues. And all our professors take it as a starting point. 
they then try to find out what kind of research can we do? What kind of new models can we develop? What should we do? How should we collaborate with academic institutions like the University of Amsterdam? Names are confusing, but uh, so, so in that second phase, we are, we, are, we are kind of partnering up with a lot of other players, but also with the, with the arts, which you can see from the video. Actually, you can see that kind of mashup of knowledge. And then as a third step, we always bring these ideas back. And I think that's also an, an, a pivotal point of, of applied oriented research is we always close that loop. Mm. And from there, we can start another step. Yeah. So uh, I think it's that art which we have tried to, um, to work on and our professors are kind of a good point uh, of example there. Yeah. Well, thank you for this uh, explanation. And uh, I think there's something else very important to explain. Yes, well, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's good for those who do not know this yet, but uh, for those who are watching this, uh, this uh, uh, live show, um, maybe you have seen on the other professors in the, uh, in the, um, in the small images wearing a, uh, a so-called Medal of Honor. And actually, there was one here in front on the table. Um, and let me just shortly explain what this, uh, what this is, actually. It's, it's, a, it's a round metal, mm -hmm. a silver-plated object. Yeah. And it actually resembles the effect of sticking your finger in a pool of water. So if you do that slowly, you get rimples out of there. And in fact, that's what we do. So we take this pool, which is basically our society. It's a little, it's like a poem. Yeah. And so it's the pool, <laughs> and we stick our finger of knowledge in it. And by that, we create ripples. And I think that's the fact that we're constantly trying to do, create an effect, not to disrupt it, mm. but to change it slowly. And I think this is what the, uh, what the Medal of Honor is representing. Yeah, and also the beautiful name, the Medal of Honors, because I think that all the professors are wearing them also with a lot of I, honor I, and, and pride. Yes, I'm uh, hap happy to see that. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for this uh, clear uh, explanation. And let's start to look at the second short video um, of design thinking uh, for the circular economy about resource, resource communities. <laughs> The Circular Project explores the certain tensions that arise when new technologies, and in this case, distributed ledger technologies, are implemented in resource communities. Resource communities are groups of people who are sharing resources, and in some cases, resources that they produce and also use communally. And these could be um, ranging from energy to mobility networks. The reason that we're looking at these communities now is that we see them emerging all over the Netherlands. So it's definitely a new phenomena that we think is not going to end anytime soon. The people living in a, a resource community face the very concrete problem of managing and checking who uses which uh, resources. And of course, considering that blockchain these days is very en vogue, so to say, we wanted to explore whether this kind of technology is a good fit for this problem space. One of the aspects that we look into is the implementation of technology and whether technology can be considered a neutral medium. When we implement these kinds of technologies in communities, we seem to think that they won't have any effect besides the facilitation of uh, managing systems. But actually, they bring along with them a certain number of values that create tensions in these neighborhoods. And we don't really know what these tensions will lead to in terms of a possible deterioration of social relationships. This is the reason why we developed a methodology and a series of design tools uh, that can be used by resource communities uh, to tease out the kind of values that they want to put in these technologies and they will end up shaping the way in which they live in the future with this technology. Schoonschip is consisting of uh, 50 family households that have taken the initiative themselves to develop their own resilient, self-supportive floating neighborhood in the city of Amsterdam. Well, learning from the research and R&D project of Circulate, we want to develop the specific questions for new communities to be developed, and so we can actually phrase the dilemmas up front. The serious game that's been developed during the Circulate project simulates real-life questions which will pop up in the operational phase of the future project to be, but are being triggered already in the process of design and decision-making up front. Something that I think is the highlight of uh, Circulate is the fact that we are not uh, technology-driven. 
uh, but we take a design uh, perspective that stems from the people in the community and targets specifically the community life and the social aspects of these communities. And this is why I think uh, that a project like this uh, falls squarely in the field of civic interaction design. Yes, and when we talk about ripple effects, I think this is a beautiful example where you see how technology touches uh, social relationships and communities. So that is a beautiful example. But now, uh, the moment where everybody's been waiting for, the inaugural lecture of Martijn de Waal. He is a professor uh, leading the research group of civic interaction design, and his research focus is on the relation between digital media and public space, with a specific interest in civic media and digital peacemaking. He has a background in journalism, in media studies and practical philosophy, and is now exploring the connection between these disciplines and the field of design. So with great honor, I introduce Martijn de Waal. Yeah, thank you for that uh, introduction, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I want to express my gratitude also to the rector and the dean for the trust bestowed on me. It's a great honor to be here today, uh, starting uh, a new phase in the electorate that from uh, today on has been called civic interaction design. And also a warm welcome to all my friends, uh, family, colleagues in research, in education. Um, I wish I could say it's so great to see you all here today together. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case. Well, we'll have to do that some other time. But I'm really grateful that you're here, that you're watching, and that you're sharing this moment uh, with me, with the research group, and with everybody involved in our projects. So what I would like to do today is talk about civic interaction design. Um, I have three chapters. The first one is, what is it? Um, why is the second chapter? Why should we talk about it? Why is it important to talk about civic interaction design? And then third, I would like to talk about how are we going to uh, approach that from our uh, research group. So let's begin. What is civic interaction design? And I think we've already given you two examples in the, in the clips that you showed, the projects for the city making and circulate. And both of them approach civic interaction design from a slightly different perspective. The first one, uh, the 40 city making, uh, there we are looking at um, new media, digital media that are evolving, things like augmented reality, projection mapping, and we're looking how can we apply that in the domain of civics? How we can we use this new technology, figure out how they work to make traditional processes of participation uh, more interesting, more visual, more uh, uh, yeah, attracting maybe a broader audience by creating new instruments. So that's one thing that we do, applying interactive technologies to the domain of civics. Another thing is, and I think the circuit project is really uh, an example of that, um, is that we do not just design the technologies themselves, but we also organize a debate around the implementation of those technologies. Uh, what does it mean to actually start living in a research community and have a blockchain and have digital, pro uh, digital platforms organize the way that you live together and that you share your energy together? And I think what both projects um, have in common um, huh, is that what we're seeing or, or what we're doing is actually helping citizens to become part of shaping the future of their cities, right? Being part of the debate or shaping it themselves because they're starting up an energy community. And I think also both projects uh, in some way are, we can call them civic because they contribute to what we could call a public good or something that's of communal concern or maybe a societal mission. And the first example of 4D city making, it's about the democratic process. The second one, circulate, is about empowering citizens to become part of the energy uh, transition. And what is it that we do then? I think this definition from Gordon and Mugar from 2020, I think it really sums it up, right? It makes it really concrete. As civic interaction designers, uh, what we do is we design tools, media, uh, uh, interaction, interactive formats uh, for people to interact with each other, uh, to form alliances around a the theme that they find important, uh, to generate shared interest, and to take care of matters of public concern. And um, 
I would say that's of course not something new. That's something that uh, has been part of society for, for a long time. And I think the work that we do is really much related to something that's also being called civil society. Right, civil society, and I've uh, shown you some examples here in this slide, are sort of the traditional forms that citizens are becoming active in society and try to shape uh, yeah, the, the, the society itself. And that can be through formal organizations like unions uh, fighting for workers' rights, or it can be through housing associations, for example, when they were founded more than 100 years ago. It was a civic initiative because uh, they wanted to create affordable and inclusive houses for the workers. Class. Um, it can also be initiated by the government, uh, by sort of formal participation procedures, or it can actually be something really informal. It's just citizens getting together, for example, in this uh, last picture on this slide, uh, it's a food drive. Citizens getting together on the neighborhood level uh, uh, to organize uh, solidarity uh, with, 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 with other people. And um, I think with all these, again, with all these yeah, examples show, and I think that's sort of the core of, of civics. Uh, it's about citizens making citizens part of the process of shaping uh, society. But it can also be the other round, way around. It can also be about making sure that the way society is being shaped addresses the needs of citizens. Right? It's not doesn't mean civic society doesn't mean that citizens have to solve all the problems. If you look at the housing association, for example, it's not the workers who build the houses themselves. No, it's the invention of a new organizational form that takes care of the needs of a particular group in society. And I think that's really what civic interaction design is about. So I think you still could say, you know, what's so special or what's so interesting about it? I mean, in a way, you could say some interaction designers, they make an app for Uber, others make an app for a housing association or for an energy community or for an organization like Greenpeace. What is so special about it? And I think the reason that uh, we find it really important to talk about civic interaction design as a discipline or as an emerging field, maybe in between all kinds of disciplines, is that it's not just a matter of applying technology to the domain of civics, but it's the domain of civics changing itself, right? Civics, or this organization of public life, as we also call it, is now taking place in what we call a network society, a society that is increasingly mediated through digital technologies, through digital platforms, all kinds of networks, and that shapes also what we call the social order. And that means that civics is now becoming something different. So we're not only designing civic tools, we also have to figure out actually what it is, civics, in this society. And um, I've illustrated this with, uh, with this diagram. I mean, you could say that uh, what we call civics, the involvement of citizens in the shaping of society, that's not something that stands on itself, right? It's always happening in a force field, a power field, with other institutional players, for example, the government uh, or the market, and they interact with each other. And I think what we're seeing now is that in all these domains, uh, amongst others due to the uh, to, to sort of the digital transition that we're, we're in, but not only that, we're seeing a lots of shifts happening. So if we look at the government, for example, for the last uh, 20, 25 years, we've seen a huge tendency for liberalization. So we're leaving more and more traditional tasks that the government would do, taking care of uh, public values, taking care of the world, of society, uh, we're leaving that to the market. If we look to the market itself, I think one of the yeah, really important um, developments there is something that we've called platformization. I've written, uh, co-authored a book with Jose van Dijk and Thomas Poole about that, the platform society. And in that book, we describe how more and more sectors of society are yeah, becoming dominated by tech platforms, yeah, whether it's Amazon in shopping or whether it's Google uh, in, in all kinds of uh, Google education, for example, in, in, in education, um, whether it's Uber in transport. Uh, these platforms take on a new role in organizing various sectors of society. And they pretend that they're sort of neutral marketplaces, just connecting supply and demand, but they're not. Uh, they, in, in the book, we demonstrate that they're actually designed uh, around particular values. Uh, for instance, one of the things that they do really well is that they offer individualized services for consumers. 
Um, what they also do really well is uh, uh, creating a lot of profit for the shareholders. But those platforms, they do not really take public values into account that much. They say, that's not of our business. We're just marketplaces. And then if we look the yellow bubble to society uh, itself, I think also there we see a really important shift happening um, that we could call networked individualization. So it means that the way that people organize themselves socially has really been shifting. And some have been calling this a shift from in, also in citizenship, from dutified citizenship to actualizing citizenship. And what these authors mean by that is dutified citizenship is that people uh, uh, yeah, are part of all kinds of organization because they feel it's their duty, right? They are part of a, of a union, for instance, because everybody else is. Or they subscribe to a local newspaper because yeah, that's what you do, right? When you grow up and when you start your own family. And we still see now that a lot of citizens are still interested in the world around them. They still want to participate, but they don't do that out of duty, but they do it more and more out of uh, sort of intrinsic motivation. Yeah? For example, the people starting an energy uh, community. And the digital transformation is giving all these groups also more and more tools to do so, the social networks, collaboration tools, tools to uh, campaign. And I think, and this is a very interesting development, I think sort of across the political spectrum, we see new kinds of social organizations popping up. Right on the on sort of the more conservative side, we see uh, identitarian movements using blogs and talk radio and social networks to express their concern for their from their point of view, what's happening to the world. If we look at the more progressive side of the political spectrum, we see really lots of initiatives of people trying to organize things in the form of an urban commons, people organizing public spaces in new ways, and. Um, I think there is a huge promise there because in all those initiatives you see a lot of energy, a lot of uh, people that are very involved in society and want to contribute. But of course there's also a huge risk, right? It could also risk, could also lead to fragmentation or uh, to polarization in society. So if we sort of redraw the picture, what we're seeing is probably could look something like this, right? We have uh, the, uh, the market, big, big tech, really playing an important role in our society. Um, to a certain extent, their commercial uh, services have become also our de facto civic infrastructure, right? Because all those, what I've called network publics, those small organizations, they're using those technologies of the big technological players. Um, and uh, yeah, the landscape of social movements, uh, there, is, there is a lot of them, but it's also a bit, uh, it's also a bit uh, fragmented, and I think what's even more important is that those forms of organizing these local movements through these networks, it's really new, and we're only just barely starting to understand how exactly that works. So civics, the, the, the relation between the different players is really changing, and um, yeah, how, how do we take care of the needs of citizens in this new landscape? And um, the answer is we, we don't really know because it's really shifting and, and that's why it's so important to find out, especially uh, because uh, society is also faced with this, uh, a number of yeah, very important challenges or you could say uh, societal missions that we really should you know, collaborate uh, together to, to address. So I guess the proposition that we're making um, is that uh, if this is uh, uh, the society and the different actors that are there, then maybe civic interaction design uh, as a discipline can sort of help figure out um, yeah, what uh, civic interaction could mean in this, in this new uh, order, in this new social order. Uh, on the one hand, by designing new tools, by designing new methods, uh, like we did with the 40 city making project, but also um, by uh, not only applying the technologies, but also by using design to think what civics actually look like in this society, right? So it's not only uh, civic interaction design, it's also designing civic interaction in new ways. And what we found uh, is that um, around 
the topic of civic interaction, a lot of new roles are emerging. Uh, for instance, we see that on the one hand, we see a lot of citizens and collectives, um, and we see that it's often designers or architects or other professionals who play an important role in what we call coalitioning. So around a particular topic, say the energy transition, they really try to put together a coalition, a group of people to actually work on that particular topic. Uh, because it's no longer, there's no longer one clear organization that really can address that uh, topic in this, in, this, in this new social order. Um, something else that we see design uh, uh, really being good at is something we call imagining. So uh, designers use the, uh, their, their imaginative powers to also think through what the impact of technology on society can be by coming up with maybe alternatives, by critiquing some of the um, developments that we're seeing and bringing out a broader discussion. And um, a last important thing that we also see sort of happening in this new landscape, a new role also perhaps for design, is something we call institutioning. So it's making a relation between sort of all the citizens, their collectives, um, and governance, for instance, right? Because it's really nice if a civic interaction designer comes up with a new way in which citizens, for instance, can discuss something together, a topic like we did in the 4D city making project, but of course, that's only helpful if somebody is listening, right? So it's not just a matter of organizing citizens, it's also organizing the link with uh, governmental parties. The same we see in projects that we're doing, like uh, the Circulate project, uh, we see a lot of interesting innovation and in initiatives emerging from these energy communities, but sometimes they have uh, difficulty in realizing uh, their objectives because, for instance, there are uh, some old laws that are still prohibiting particular applications. Yeah, so design is not this designing that platform for that community, it's bringing together that coalition in the first place of architects, of tech developers, of residents. It's imagining, you know, what could it look like? Um, and it's also institutioning in the sense of interacting with the government to make sure that those things can actually happening. And, um, of course, you know, if, if you look at this picture, that's, that's a really huge challenge, right? It's a really big topic to rethink civic interaction in the network society. And the good thing is that we're not doing that alone. I think we're part of an international movement uh, of research centers, but also civic initiatives around the world that are springing up and they're using slightly different terms sometimes, such as public design or um, uh, careful design, but they're all about the same thing. They're all addressing this question, uh, how can we make sure that in this emerging network society, the needs of citizens are taken care of and how citizens can sort of become part of shaping uh, the world around them. And I think we're here also in a really good position, and I have to give a nod to my predecessor, uh, Ben Schouten, who founded this lectorate uh, in 2013, because already uh, in his inaugural address, uh, about seven or eight years, he already in introduced the term civic interaction design as one of the objectives of the lectorate. So I think a lot of what we're doing today is really building up uh, on uh, the work that he laid out. And uh, yeah, I want to say thank you for that as well to Ben. Um, one side note though, because if you look at this, uh, um, I think it's a little bold, right? Sort of to put design so squarely in the middle of everything as if design can save every pro problem in the world. Uh, and, um, and that's of course not the case, right? I think we have to realize that a lot of the problems are very much political problems. Like we cannot solve the energy transition, we cannot solve structural inequalities just with a, a pile of post-it notes, right? We really need uh, the government to be part of that, we need the market to be part of that, and we need citizens and collectives to be part of that. So, you know, I think our role is more like this, right? We're in the background and we're adding the qualities of design to this yeah, larger process of uh, yeah, shaping society. So that brings me to the third and last chapter. How are we going to do that? How do we think what we can contribute um, yeah, with, uh, with design? 
to uh, organizing citizens, uh, uh, network publics around societal challenges. Well, we're going to do that by uh, what we call research through design, and that's not a term we made up ourselves, of course, but it's an approach that uses design as a research method. So we're going to design interventions in society like we did at uh, the Schoonschip community, like we did uh, at ARCAM, uh, on the one hand to test out what kind of new tools can be that, that people can use to change, to change their world, to change their surroundings, to be part of the shaping of the world, but we're also doing that to better understand what is, uh, what is happening, uh, how uh, the world is un unfolding around us. And this is a moment, I think is a good moment to introduce the team. Uh, because um, the research group of civic interaction design, it's not just me, my, my role is, is actually quite modest. It's really this great group of people that together uh, pick up uh, a number of those uh, yeah, issues that are brought in by partners in society. So here they are. Uh, we have Miriam, we have Ben, we have Anders, we have Gabriele, we have Wouter, Dolinde, Marije, Morgana, Pamela, Tamara, Wouter, Katie, Julia, Angela and Carol, and uh, we also have two new members that have only recently started and we don't even have their picture yet so recently. So Bouderijn and Sky, also welcome to the group of Civic Interaction Design. So it's these people together with our colleagues from education, uh, the learning communities that we also have in our faculty, um, and together with, and this is really important, I think Gelijn already mentioned that, uh, is that in all of our projects, research projects, we work with all kinds of uh, organizations, companies, uh, local governments, uh, uh, who are actually working on these themes um, as professionals. And we're very glad, and this is just uh, 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 yeah, a, a brief overview, there's many more, but I couldn't fit everybody uh, in, in one slide, uh, but this is to give you sort of an idea of the variety of people that we're working with. And for us it's very important because these are the people that are actually shaping uh, uh, society. These are the people that introducing those new technologies, new ways of collaborating, new ways of design uh, in society. Uh, and for us it's really great to be able to work with them to figure out uh, how we can give shape to civic life in a network society. And together we do that in uh, three types of research. Um, the first is form and experiment. The second is context and transformation. And the third we've called power, possibilities and imaginaries. And I'll briefly discuss them and show some of the research projects that we're doing in that field. So form and experiment is the research uh, approach uh, in which we uh, take a look at new technologies as they unfold. We try to understand what are these new technologies? How can we use them in the context of civics? Uh, I've already given you this example, but we do um, a, a lot more. For instance, Miriam Vosmeer has working uh, for a long time already in various projects on virtual reality. And she tries to, uh, again, with partners, with other researchers, tries to understand of how does that medium work? How can we tell a story in it? How do people experience it? And then once we understand that, then we can apply it in the context of, of civics. Right, then we can sort of design civic in or, or virtual realities, for instance, in the context of a museum or a festival that can invite people to reflect on the theme of, of diversity. And we have people working in different uh, technical uh, disciplines. So Anders and Karel and our former colleague Riemer van Rosen, um, they have a background in game design. We also work a lot with uh, our colleagues from the lecturate Urban Spatial Transformation at the Faculty of Technology, Frank Surenbroek, and together in this project with uh, Julia and Boudewijn, we're exploring design of public spaces uh, in times of COVID, uh, but we also have been looking at the design of interactive public spaces. So how can we apply digital media technologies, in this case at the Arena Boulevard in Amsterdam, to make uh, public spaces more interesting and more lively. And I think what all these projects do is uh, coming from uh, yeah, design disciplines or interactive design disciplines like HCI or game design, urban interaction design, digital design, um, in the context of civics, 
try to understand yeah what 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 is this what is this um what is this particular medium? How can we design with it? What is the grammar, the language of it? Can we come up with design guidelines? Investigating these new technologies in the context of civics to help other designers uh, make better, more interesting products. The second research that, part, uh, that we're doing, or approach, um, we call context and transformation. And now we're moving uh, from sort of uh, yeah, experimenting with the technology itself we are moving it into an actual uh, uh, space. Um, I think the, the project of Schoon Schip and the, the, the circular project is an example of that. Another project that we did, uh, amongst others, with Gabriele Ferri, uh, Karel Millenaar, Ben Schouten, and colleagues from other universities, such as Michiel, Tara, Christina, and Fraukje, um, and one architecture. Uh, as an architectural firm, uh, we really try to understand, okay, what does it mean um, to um, develop a neighborhood um, as a coalition of bottom-up groups? So um, there was an architectural firm, One Architecture. It was involved in the redevelopment of Buikslaartenham, which is a former industrial area in the northern part of Amsterdam. And um, they had uh, aligned themselves with lots of other local partners, other architectural firms, technological companies, uh, future residents. And they said, how can we collaboratively develop this area uh, according to the logic of the circular economy? Because we find that is a very important theme. And what we did with them is on the one hand, we designed uh, a number of tools, workshop formats, uh, online tools for knowledge sharing, for instance, uh, between them, uh, tools uh, for them to share alliances, have discussions with each other. But we also looked at the process itself, of design itself. Uh, and one of the things we found, this is one of the first pro uh, projects where we found the importance of what I've called institutioning before. Because in order to move on with our plans for these groups, it was really important to have the government on board and to prove to the local government that what they were doing was actually contributing to public values, right? So that became sort of a new task for the designers because they didn't wait for the government to give them assignment. They come up with their own assignment, but for them it was really important to prove how that was actually beneficial for society so uh, they could work with the government in an interesting way. So what we're doing in this research strand is, it's not so much the design of the technological projects themselves, it's more the things around it, right? It's talking about the values that we find important with the, uh, the future users of those technologies, with the future communities. It's involving them in the design of the project. So here we draw upon much more from disciplines as participatory design, situated design, value-sensitive design, uh, and what we do, what we produce here, uh, is yeah, theories, ideas, but are practical guidelines and toolkits of how you can do this process of institutioning, uh, how you can organize those coalitions. Last one, um, and we're almost at the end now, is uh, a last research trend is power, possibilities, and imaginaries. And here we're drawing upon the power of design um, yeah, it's imaginative power. I think design is also really good in uh, yeah, showing us future visions of the world and uh, either worlds that we would really like or maybe also dystopian versions uh, of the world that we don't really like. And we can use those to think about uh, yeah, the role of technology in society and uh, bring those more speculative uh, projects into the public debate or in the professional debate. So here's one example of a project that we did. Uh, we did a series of workshops, for instance, together with our colleagues from Northumbria University um, uh, to imagine what the future of the blockchain could look like in the civic domain. And uh, that spurred a debate, it spurred a number of articles also in professional uh, magazines. Uh, so in that way, we tried to contribute to the discussion about the impact of these technologies from a perspective of civic values. Um, and so here we're drawing upon the logic and the, the, the disciplines of speculative design or design for debate. Uh, and what we bring in is imaginaries, alternative futures, criticisms and concepts. So I'm going to round off. Um, and I think if you 
you know, count up all those examples that I've given to you, those three different research strands, which of course do not completely stand by themselves. Uh, they're often intermingled in our research project. I think what you will see, and you already see that now, but I hope so in, in five years from now, uh, you will see that we will have developed a portfolio of really a lot of different projects. And some projects will be about sort of one technology and maybe one societal theme. Another will be uh, about another technology and another societal theme. And um, it, it, there will be, a, yeah, quite a broad variety uh, because I don't think we want to specialize at this moment into only one technology or only one theme. Because I think, and that's my hope, of doing all these different projects with all these different partners is that if you take them together, uh, at the end, uh, uh, they all contribute to, I think, this question, which is, yeah, I think at the heart of the electorate. Uh, and it is how can citizens, institutions, and companies collaboratively shape society to address the needs of citizens and matter of public concern and contribute to societal missions? Right? I think that's the main question that's driving us forward, and that's you know, how we yeah, want to also contribute um, to the professional field. And if you read that, uh, I hope you are, and, and when you listen to this, I hope you also hear uh, an open invitation in this. Because in many of those projects, what we can bring in from the electorate is the perspective of design, the perspective of interaction design. Uh, but if we are going to work together and collaborate on a theme like the energy transition, for example, I think it's really important for us to work together, as we already do, uh, with companies, research groups, uh, governments uh, that bring in technological expertise or more psychological expertise. Uh, and that's really my wish for the future, that we work together on these societal themes where we can bring in the perspective of civic interaction design. So that was it. Uh, thank you for listening. and. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I hope I was able to inspire you to reach out to us and join us in, in one of our coalitions. And before I give the word back, I just wanted to take one more minute to say a word of thanks. Um, and um, there's lots of people to thank, and I can't mention them all here, um, but just a brief overview of people that I would really like to thank. Um, of course, to start, uh, the rector and the dean for the trust they've put in me um, for this wonderful position. I'd like to thank my predecessor, Ben Schouten, I already said, I really paved the way for what we're doing at the electorate today. Uh, I'd like to thank him for all the inspiring conversations we had on this topic. Um, I'd like to thank Gabriele Ferry as uh, the head of program of the Master Digital Design and also one of the researchers in our group. And uh, like uh, Mahutin has said, my background is in the humanities um, and it was really him and Ben together who brought me into this, uh, yeah, into, into the bringing in sort of the design aspect in that. So thanks for all the conversations we had there. Um, thank you all the people in the research group. Um, we haven't seen each other for a year almost, and it's really strange to talk to you uh, through a screen like this. I miss you, and I really hope we can you know, get to back together really uh, soon again. Um, thanks also to the wonderful people in education collaborating with us. Thanks to our partners in society. Thanks to the partners in other research institutes. Um, and of course, finally, I would like to thank my friends, my parents, my family, uh, Anna, Kees, Camille, thank you all so much for everything. Wow, and thank you, Martijn de Waal, for this very impressive and inspirational lecture. It really was. I think it was a, a, a brilliant story um, where you really, um, yeah, gave us insight in all the work that you uh, have done the last couple of years with the big group of people and organizations that you worked with. So that was really important uh, to see all of this and also to feel it a little bit like this. It was about creating, about co-creating, about raising important questions to create debate of shaping our lives. So very, very important. I can imagine that people at home want to hear more of these subjects because there were a 
lot of subjects. Uh, and tomorrow there is an opportunity. At uh, 6.30, Martijn will be hosting a live cast, um, Media Architecture Through the Lens of Civic Interaction Design, here in Pakhuis de Zwijger. But first, we're going to look at our third clip, and that's the last video. Well, Martijn will take a seat at our table, and that is about the government. He already talked about it, the institutions are an important role in this story. How society government can provide more meaningful services and relations with their citizens. And government as a platform, as we found out through some brainstorming sessions with Martijn de Waal and DSS, is actually the community of municipalities and the government to give access to all the inhabitants of Holland in a transparent, equal and inclusive way and make technology work for the inhabitants to get access to the product and services with focus on the inhabitants. Uh, the goal of the collaboration is that if we show society what government as a platform can be, it will start a collaboration within the government to make it happen. We made it really concrete by, by uh, starting with a project of people giving birth. The brief that we gave to the students is that we wanted to find out how we could make concrete birth as a life experience, but in the form of a, a government as a platform. And we used uh, service design and design thinking um, and in a multidisciplinary team to find out how it would look like and how would such a prototype work. From the side of the municipality, they knew that there was a danger in digitalizing services, um, that public values would be lost within that. I think an important thing to mention uh, is that uh, Harlem also had some values that wanted us to convey through the, their platform. And this value were uh, agency, privacy, trust and transparency. Our goal was to redesign the municipal service of a newborn registration uh, in an accessible way for all users. And we wanted to make that goal tangible through a prototype that would um, also show the technical background of how that vision could uh, become reality. The platform consists of three phases. Uh, the first one is the information phase, where the citizen can get informed about all the process relative to the expectancy of a baby. The second one is the uh, newborn registration phase. And the last one is the continuation phase. And it happens after the baby is born. And uh, it's a phase where other services relating to the newborn baby are introduced. So in this sense, it's a lifelong service. The prototype was not only efficient, but it was also very meaningful because we engaged a lot of different parties, commercial or from the government or from municipalities, and that enriched the prototype. In the end, for the user, it made it like, I've been taken care of, I trust them. And that feeling, I guess, that is the most important outcome. Yes, and the product is here. Look at this, the product is here. And it's not only hard work, but what I see and what I felt is that there's a lot of heart and passion in this. And we can all read it in this beautiful cover. Um, but now, the moment of ceremonial importance, an important milestone in uh, the academic career of Martijn de Waal. Dean Frank Kressin, you will utter the laudatio. Yeah. Dear Martijn, dear Professor uh, De Waal, um, allow me to be the first, actually the second, I think, to first warmly congratulate you uh, with your inaugural lecture and the ambitious agenda that you've set out for your research group. I think this is the moment to receive your Medal of Honor. And, and normally I would like to give it to you, but I think you can take it due to COVID. Please <laughs> take it yourself. This is our Medal of Honor. Uh, it's a special token of distinction that you as the other lecturers can proudly wear in the years to come. 
this is also the moment in which you can relax a bit, I hope, <laughs> after spending countless hours on tweaking your lecture and your beautiful publication and your presentation that you continue to tweak until the very last moment. Um, while you were in the process of writing, you shared with me the famous quote by Nathaniel Hawthorne, who says, easy reading, reading is damn hard writing. <laughs> and considering the highly readable results, it must have been a hell of a job, uh, Martijn. So thank you, well, congratulations. In your lecture, you refer to several projects, publications and workshops that you have contributed to in the past years. You came to the Havia in 2014 and became person yeah, personal lector, personal lector, personal professor, and then primus inter pares which ended when you succeeded Ben Schouten as a full professor. But your engagement with, with engagement with your current theme goes much further back. In 2007, you and Michiel de Lange founded the think tank, The Mobile City, that deals with the influence of digital media technologies on urban life and what this means for urban design and policy. The Mobile City quickly became an international anchor point for scholars, activists, designers and practitioners in this then nascent field that you now call civic interaction design. You've always been at the forefront of developments. When the world became focused on smart cities, you discovered the smart citizen. When those in power were looking for larger than life projects, your gaze turned to the many small bottom up initiatives that sprung up all around the world. When people embraced those developments as truly democratic and part of a big society scheme, you actually pointed out that it's many of us that are still deprived, excluded and unable to participate on equal terms. They need care. This political nature of technology, overlooked by many technicians, scholars and politicians, is firmly embedded in your work. Over the years, you curated and chaired conferences, you conceived, uh, conceived and developed numerous research projects, and you wrote and edited articles and books. Your work is internationally acclaimed, and you are well respected, a driving force between many current developments in your area. That said, the field of civic interaction design is actually an amalgam of various theories, practices and disciplines, sometimes wildly apart, with different vocabularies, paradigms and standards. But to be able to identify and then flourish in this field, somebody, or maybe more somebody, some bodies, had to bring these, these things together. And this, dear Martijn, dear professor, is something you have done and still do extremely well. You routinely collaborate with the sheer uncountable number of individuals, companies, organizations and governments. You have just shown a few of those with students, citizens, researchers, professionals and civil servants in the Netherlands, in Europe and in various other parts of the world. This is due, in my humble view, to the uniquely curious and open way in which you approach people in how you display true interest and empathy, to the way in which your humble and generous nature connects you to various people and then these people to each other. You mentioned modesty. I think you are the, ep the, the epitome of modesty to me and I think that is extremely effective. Let me come to my conclusion. In their essay about the urban agenda for the European Union, Susanna Potjer and Marta Heyer wrote that the urban agenda needs imaginative experiments that create new visions for the city and give people a sense of what the future city could be like. I feel that you have been doing so for more than 15 years now, and I'm certain that you and your group and your partners will continue to do so over the next at least 15 years. So I would, from my heart, like to thank you for your energy, your wit and your vision that help us to protect or even strengthen public values in the heart of society. A society that unfortunately sometimes forgets how immensely important these values actually are. Congratulations. Well, thank you. <laughs> As they say in Dutch, I'm uh, not helemaal still. Van. <laughs> <laughs> Even you! <laughs> How can this uh, Well, the Medal of Honor suits you very well. Congratulations, yeah. Martijn. And thank you, Frank, for these beautiful, beautiful words. I think they are um, yeah, special for the closing of this inauguration. Because unfortunately, we have to finish this conversation. But remember, tomorrow there's the symposium on civic interaction design and media architecture will take place. So you can join that.
Um, I would like to thank our special guest, all the professors who are at home in the Zoom. He's now part officially of the academic family, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> and now uh, Dean Frank Kressin, thank you very much. Uh, Rector Gelijn Meijer, and congratulations and special thanks to you, Martijn de Waal. And of course, family, friends, colleagues, research partners, and lecturers, and many, many more. Thank you for being here uh, today and uh, joining this celebration. I wish you all a very good afternoon.